Friends, hello and welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. I'm your host, Sarah Buino, and I am a psychotherapist in Chicago. I'm a professor. I am a trauma therapist. What else do I do? And I'm a podcaster, but you already knew that because you're here. Anyway, today's guest is literally one of my favorite humans on the planet. And it might sound like hyperbole when I say that, but have you ever had a person in your life that just literally every time you think of this person, you're like, this is my favorite human being on the planet? Well, Mashera Winston, friends, friends, family, all of you, <laughs> she is that person in my life. And if you have been a longtime listener of Conversations with a Wounded Healer, you may remember Mashera back from, I think it was February of 2018. Her episode was called Eat Snacks, Take Naps. And it was truly one of my favorite episodes, and, and I've aired it actually twice. So you may have listened to it if you joined us over the summer. Anyway, Mashera is one of my favorite people. This was a beautiful, deep, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. It was a spiritual conversation, as all of my conversations with Mashera are. But before I tell you about her, let me ask you for a favor, if you could help me out. I would really, really love and appreciate if you would be willing to rate and review us on Apple Podcast. It's a little thing that if you have an iPhone, all you have to do is click on the Apple Podcast button, which is a little purple button with a little circle thing. You know, you know the one, right? Where you actually find this if you have an iPhone and you listen on Apple Podcasts. So if you go there and you find Conversations with the Wounded Healer, you just scroll down and you can click however many stars you want. I'd prefer five, of course. And it really helps too if you actually write something. And I promise to honor what I have said before, that if you write something that makes me laugh, I will read it on air and then you'll be totally famous, you guys. Oh my God. Okay. Now on to Mashera. Mashera Winston, LCSW. As a Black queer woman, Mashera reminds BIPOC and LGBTQIA folks and folks of faith that our ancestors were already mental health experts before colonial trauma. Collaboratively, she creates whole hood, whole city, whole society healing models as sustainable and affordable alternatives to individual-only therapy. Playfully and creatively, Mashera stewards communal mental wellness, education, and support groups with gifted healing expert folk like you. <sighs> so love Mashera, honor every single word that comes out of her mouth, and please enjoy our conversation together. Mashera! <laughs> Hello! <laughs> Hello, beautiful, beautiful Mashera. So happy to have you here again. Thank you. I'm really excited. I like this podcast a lot. Yay! Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Well, for folks who don't know who Mashera is, you're missing out. And her first episode with us was, I think, literally three years ago. It was in February, maybe, maybe it was. Yeah, I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was 2018, February of 2018. So go back, eat snacks, take <laughs> naps was the name of that episode. And it's still one of my favorite episodes. And I think it's literally just because you're one of my favorite people in the universe. So if you don't know who Mashera is, Mashera, do you want to tell people who you are? Okay. So I am Mashera D. Winston with all the fancy letters behind my name, which are LCSW. And I'm a Black healer. And so that includes being a communal wellness therapist and other stuff. But that's the nutshell version. Mm -hmm. And we met because you were my intern when I myself was a baby therapist and you were an embryo therapist, right? <laughs> I was but a fetus. But a fetus, right? Yeah. I think back on, I loved you the first moment I met you and I really loved teaching you and also learning together and the way that our relationship has evolved just like makes my heart grow like the Grinch's heart grew like not that I had a tiny heart before but it's like growing beyond my body because I just am so overjoyed with watching everything that's happened for you and everything that you've created for yourself and the fact that we've continued to deepen our relationship is just such a gift so thank you. Thank you. It means a lot, but we talk about it and I cry and I, I know, right? 
I'm not going to do that on today. So I'm like, <laughs> uh, you're not going to get the best of me today. Sarah. Okay. Just- all right. All right. Fine. Because people are listening. Whatever. <laughs> Well, would you like to share with folks how your work has evolved? Because I probably should have listened to the episode before we had this conversation. But initially, when you moved back to Indianapolis, you're like, I'm going to be an adventure therapist. And that's what I'm going to do. And the way that that has transformed is so interesting. Please tell us. All right. So I think I've stayed in alignment with that adventure And I've also gone back to the roots of why adventure mattered to me. Like, what was it about that playfulness? And so one of the ways that I have changed is that the questions that were in me privately are now questions that I state publicly. And so I'm the same person with the same lens. I often say, like, my training came from being a Black woman who came from Black women who were healers. And then I also went and got this degree and this license. And I'm grateful for the opportunities that I've had within the training that I received as a therapist. However, I've gone back into remembering who I was before the mental health industry. Who was I as a Black healer and a Black queer woman before that? What did I know about how healing worked? And how do I make that public now? Because it feels like we're in a time where people want to know more about that publicly now and can receive that now. So full transparency, I have a little bio here that kind of helps me tell the story of where I was and where I'm going in my work. I'll say the biggest thing is that I always knew that communal wellness was where it was at, but I wasn't speaking the same language as other healers necessarily, or as the mental health industry, which is how you get paid to be a healer. You have to throw a title and some letters on yourself. Mm -hmm. And so before that, I'm going to just kind of review where I was and where I am now and what helped me get there, this through line of like communal joy. So I've been an adventurer since childhood. I've been a trauma worker since I was a little child. I didn't know what I was doing, but I would notice people's stuff and the stuff of animals and the stuff of plants and be like, hey, I think that needs some support and assistance in my little baby mind. I'm I'm saying this and thinking mm-hmm. this. And so now I've been a therapist for almost a decade and I've transitioned to being a coach and a consultant for communal wellness. But my life experiences include separating from a faith-based cult at age 18. And that experience, which I don't want to not state that spiritual abuse, financial abuse, emotional abuse are extremely common. So I'm able to name that I was in a cult, but a lot of people have been in spiritually abusive situations or are still in them. Some would say that the very foundations of our institutions are based on cultural (laughs) and spiritual abuse, forcing people Mm -hmm. to identify with whiteness, even if they are not white, and calling Mm -hmm. it professionalism, which is something we talked about in that prior episode, but also forcing people to identify with what is called Christianity. But I look around and I'm like, Christ wasn't really about this behavior. Mm -hmm. And he was a liberal (laughs) radical. Oh, I hate to even throw Christ in there. I feel like Christ is mm-hmm. like, everybody just uses my name for all sorts of foolishness. Yeah. He's like, um, I didn't say that shit. <laughs> I didn't say that. And so in the midst of all of that, people have their own experiences with spiritual abuse and how they identify it. But I was in a global cult that my family was impacted by and their parents were impacted by. So I'm third generation. Mm-hmm. and That really influenced my commitment, that choice of mine to separate from that cult at age 18, because I knew as a six-year-old, something's not quite right here. Something about how we function as a community isn't quite right. There's some unspoken stuff that doesn't feel good in my body. And the adults aren't affirming that, but I'm going to go ahead and affirm within myself. And so I look at my old journal entries 
Ugh. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Like I knew, I knew right. something wasn't oh, right. I just got chills. Oof. Whew. Like if we will just listen to children when they tell us the truth, how much further could we be? And so separating from that cult really influenced my commitment to whole community healing through self-awareness and self-accountability and self-compassion. And so as a healer, I now publicly state, because like in the prior episode, I read that piece about all those private thoughts that were in me about this social work school, this grad program, the experiences I'm having as a a fetus and embryo therapist (laughs) are not in alignment with how healing actually works within my body and within my Black community. And so one of the questions that I now publicly ask is, as a multifaceted Black healer, let me look at this healing system. Just like I looked at the system I grew up in, that community. Let me look at the community of mental health and psychology and social work. And I say to myself, if the point of healthcare is restoration and recovery, but the European founders of psychology, social work, and therapy had never seen safe, thriving, Black, Indigenous, or people of color, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex or asexual people, or spiritually diverse folks, folks that weren't of their exact same Mm -hmm. faith, as the wellness standard, then what exactly are we restoring those groups to? Health is supposed to be about restoring But if the models that we use, the models that we're trained in in social work schools, the models that we use in our therapy rooms and in our podcasts and in our psychology texts and in the the ways that we use that word community in social work, if those models were never based on believing that those groups not only thrive, but are the experts of their thriving and had mental health industries before colonial trauma, were already doing it and know what they need, then what are we restoring them to? We literally have never seen them thrive. So are we restoring them to whiteness? What are we restoring them to? Right. Are we restoring them to the harm of those that kidnapped them or took their land or just did not believe their faith was equal? to the faith of those who were visiting. And so my work now has shifted to more publicly naming that those groups that I said, BIPOC, LGBTQIA plus people, and folks of faith, many faiths, that our ancestors were already mental health experts. And they were mental health experts before colonial trauma, and that our models and the ones that I co-create with folks are for whole hood, whole city, whole society healing that is sustainable and affordable as an alternative to just having individual therapy. Because mm-hmm. I think individual care is important, but I also think like, what's the point of getting better if everyone you know and love is sick? Ooh, wait, yeah. Like, I, ooh, Yeah, I'm having a reaction to that because like, that's my family experience, right? And I know that's your family experience too. Yes, it's the person who comes to me because they have, thank goodness, through struggle and through all sorts of things, they have acquired the money, the access, the internet, the literacy, the privilege of Mm -hmm. finding a private therapist that also share some of their lived experiences. And then I say, well, yes, I'm a therapist, but I choose to offer coaching and mental wellness skills. Let's get started. That is the privileged person in the family. But what about your mom? What about your cousins? What about your niece and nephew? They have not achieved those things or do not feel comfortable coming to me. Maybe they don't fit into that whole everybody needs a therapist idea. Maybe that's not their lived experience. And maybe we honor the fact that it has never been safe in the mental health community to be anything other than white and cisgender and straight and privileged. Right. And so it has not even been safe for white men. Like it's just not been safe as a so-called patient, as a client. It just has not been safe. And so 
I wonder with these models, especially when we're in a place like I am currently, the middle of the country. I'm black <laughs> in the middle, as I like to say. I'm black <laughs> in the yeah. middle of yeah. the country. I'm not on one of the progressive coasts. Right. And so what happens when I go to individual therapy, but no one else in my family is getting that nourishment or that care? No one else can afford it. Nobody else is engaging with it. No one's in a journal or a workbook or self-help book or a support group. What happens when I start growing and changing and it makes me real lonely and it isolates me in wellness? Oh, quit reading my diary. <laughs> Woo! And my God. loved one say, I've changed. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a butterfly. I'm butterflying. You know, it's okay. We can all butterfly. And they say, you don't seem familiar and I don't know what you're talking about. That's painful. The most healed member of the family is in pain sometimes because they lose their family. They lose community. And I know what that's like because I left that cult and I lost my whole community. I'm crying over here, everyone. <laughs> fucking reading my soul here. Okay. Hey, therapists. Do I have something exciting for you? Head Heart Conversations is a webinar series for psychotherapists designed to invite your inner healer to the forefront of your personal and professional life. At my practice, Head Heart Therapy, we approach healing from the inside out. We believe that in order to offer the best care to our clients, we therapists must do our inner healing work as well. At this point in history, we are called to move beyond the old ways of being and courageously step into a new paradigm. Therapists are poised to support our clients' transformation, but we must also transform ourselves. In this four-part series, we will invite participants to learn about themselves as well as enhance their clinical skills. The first webinar takes place on March 5th, and it's called dun, 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 Conversations with a Wounded Healer, and it's a call to action intended to challenge participants to step into their own healing with courage. As a special thank you to Conversations with a Wounded Healer listeners, you can get $20 off your order by using the code PODCAST when you register. For more information and to register, please visit www.tinyurl.com slash hhconvos. And don't forget to use the code PODCAST. If we don't find and follow through with models of communal mental wellness. It's not just that we leave people behind, which is already terrible. It's that the person who is all over Instagram with their meditation post and their crystals and their uh, head wrap, and that's me. I'm, I'm <laughs> describing myself right now. So let's, I'm not just reading other people. I love a head wrap, honey. <laughs> But while that's happening, that person gets lonelier. That person loses their friends, loses their networks, because we're not teaching people how to form whole well communities. We're teaching individuals how to leave toxic patterns. And so, again, my work now focuses, as it did before, but in a more outspoken way in a more publicly verbalized way, that mental wellness is communal. And that's how it was ancestrally. And that's what is sustainable and it's affordable. It's sustainable because if everyone starts understanding, as mm -hmm. I, I personally believe, that everyone comes from ancestors who were mental health experts, it's not just who can get to a private therapy session. It's all of our ancestors had this knowledge in their bodies. And so when they gathered around that like campfire and you celebrated that so-and-so is pregnant and so-and-so is about to have their coming of age ceremony and so-and-so lost their father, then everyone together has gathered. And we might've gathered because, you know, we want to do some dances around the fire. We want to play and we want to celebrate. And we do that even now in the hood and people of color do it. We gather. And when we get together, we are playful. Mm -hmm. But there's also those moments where you go stand out on the porch and someone might say, oh, I'm going to go smoke. Or they might say, I'm going to go in the kitchen and check on the food. And what do you do in those spaces? You check on each other and you say, how are you really doing? What's been going on with you? We gather 
and we play and that playing tells our brains and our bodies that we're safe because you can't play when you don't feel safe. It won't work. Mm -mm. It won't work. And so my work has always helped people as I learned as a child to play and that the playing, even if I had to do it by myself, because that was the safest thing for me in this environment, but that playing, it's like it opens up your body and your brain to be able to consider receiving new information. It creates a loving and safe experience, even when you have PTSD from chronic oppression or chronic family stress or chronic whatever. It's like it opens you up. The playing means you're safe. And when you're safe, you're safe to feel. And that matters because people that can't feel can't heal. And too often we told people who are oppressed, you need to cut off your emotions. You just need to work your body until the literal dirt mm -hmm, to pick mm -hmm. cotton and sugar cane. And we've told women, don't worry about all those feelings. You're just being dramatic. You need to raise 1 million kids, whether you even want it to be a mother of a million or not. That's how you can be a good woman. That's how you can be a good insert group, whatever the group is. And so I think to myself, what is the point of mental health care that doesn't actually sit well with folks like your cousins or your mom or your dad? It has to be communal. We have to gain this knowledge communally and recognize that it is not about going to the village healer, the village medicine woman, the village witch doctor, the village priest. All those things are beautiful. That's their profession. And they have studied and trained, I would hope, my goodness, goodness <laughs> gracious, I would hope they have trained at the feet of their elders. My mm -hmm. God, <laughs> I won't even get into my tangent about people <laughs> saying, I'm a healer. What mm -hmm. did you study? A two-week course. What? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what? But there's that person in community. But then there's also, what if everybody around that fire knew that everyone here is a gifted healer? Everyone here is talented. Everyone here is a healer and, in my opinion, a harmer, depending on how we choose to practice self-awareness hurting because of what we're going through, ongoing chronic trauma sometimes, or the crops failed, we're in a drought. And then also, if we talk about being a healer, a harmer, hurting, but also a helper. So how do we help each other? There's a difference between thinking like in my community, I am one of three Black queer women therapists who are licensed in the whole dang city to my knowledge, in the whole city. So like what happens when folks realize it's not about those three women. It's about everybody in this community. Every person on this block is a healer if they choose to be, mm -hmm. is a harmer if they choose to not be self-aware, right. is hurting because of what we go through individually and communally, chronically and recently. Mm -hmm. And also is a helper if we will put our egos to the side and do our own individual daily work before we show up to help others, then we've got abundant gifts. Everybody is abundant in some way. And so what I say is that our current model of individual only therapy is actually not sustainable. And it's not sustainable because what are we going to do when we run out? of Black, Indigenous, and person of color therapists, when we run out of insurance payments, mm -hmm. we run out of psychology students willing to learn European American healing mindsets. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? Because as we keep saying this word, healing, 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 therapy, thriving, abundance, as we keep saying those words, the entire African diaspora the entire person of color global population is like, hey, you know what I deserve? Self-care. You know what I deserve? Mm -hmm. Thriving instead of surviving. You know what I deserve? Healing. And then what do they do? They flood therapists like me. And I'm one of three in the whole city of these particular identities who is also licensed. And so I realized that we 
deserve healing models that support where we've been as a society and also where we're trying to grow together. They've got to be sustainable. It's not sustainable to have everyone running to one therapist or to keep pushing marginalized students through these institutions that harm them when they get there and exploit them when they get there. And then them going into agencies to give free therapy and having all of their types of people that identify with them and their identities immediately funneled to them so that they can hold all of this collective trauma while getting paid nothing for years. So the public is like, oh, discount therapy. That student is breaking under the weight of their whole community's trauma, not to mm-hmm. mention their agency's trauma that mm-hmm. has not been addressed. And so my work now is to co-create with people, to let folks know you are a healer. Your institution is full of healers. Your board is full of healers. Your neighborhood is full of healers. So how do we co-create full-bodied healing communities for individuals, for institutions, on a personal level, through us all doing our own daily work? Why are we having diversity and inclusion training when the, the CEO won't go and do their own personal daily work? That's right. We've got all this staff turnover, but every single person on the block ought to have access to daily mental wellness practices and those practices not be gatekept or they have to attend a $1,000 an hour workshop to get them. And so my work and where I've gone came from recognizing that our mental health expert ancestors knew that there was power in gathering and there was power in playing. And I feel like communities, especially communities of color, queer and trans communities, spiritually diverse communities, they recognize that now they gather and they play. And what do we do? We criminalize it. We say it's too loud. It's too rowdy. Why are there 700 Black people all trying to get into the building? They're trying to get in there so they can have some fun, for one. And people deserve recreation, which is why I became an adventure therapist. They deserve that play. But once they do that, their body says, oh my God, even in the midst of colonial foolishness, maybe even just for a few seconds, I'm safe. And when that body feels safe, it can start feeling and connecting with other people. So now you've got 700 healers in the space that are realizing, oh, I'm a healer. Let's say they're all trying to get into the skating rink. Well, I'm a skater too, but I'm also a healer. And so when we realize that the healers we have access to are not three therapists in a city, it's the whole city. If the city has a population of a million, we've got a million healers. If people will do their daily individual work. Mm -hmm. And so there is still a place for individual therapy and individual care and individual sessions and appointments. But what can we do alongside that so that the whole community, the whole hood and the whole family has access to mental wellness skills at their level? So if I think about my family, my father really struggles with literacy. And ongoing physical and emotional and mental disabilities are in my family, including in me. Like I had to do stuff so my back wouldn't hurt so that I could be on this session today. So how do we honor that people deserve access to mental wellness community and that they are gifted just like I am gifted and my spine doesn't have to work the way so-and-so's does. My mind doesn't have to work the same way. And so within that, we get together, we gather, we play, we feel, and because we feel, we begin to apply these principles of healing. And that's where I come in is helping people to gather and to play and to call out also the ways in which historically Black people and other groups, Indigenous people, have not been allowed to gather and drum, have not been allowed to gather and go to the skating rink or dance because every time those groups try to gather, here comes police, here comes supervision, here comes surveillance. Let's do a study on you. Let's observe you. If you want grant funding, then you have to tell us all your results and your outcomes. 
here comes surveillance. So people can't really feel and heal because they're still being watched and witnessed for the entertainment and curiosity of others. So I believe in, at this point, support groups that are private and that are based on people's lived experiences. So like, I want there to be more trans support groups in my area. I'm not trans. I have no business running them. Mm -hmm. What I can do is offer a building or offer a platform, and then I can step out of the room because it's not my business. Mm -hmm. And I think that pulling ego away as a healer is important too. And so what do we do so that people have access to playfully and creatively co-create mental wellness? And I do that through education and support groups now on Patreon, which people can subscribe to. But I do that through writing. I do that through videos. I do that to make the healing accessible. And I also, within institutions and individuals, I'm like, yeah, and we can do private stuff too. We can do individual sessions. We can do private stuff. But let's talk about how if healing isn't accessible to my 65-year-old, semi-literate, manual labor father, then we haven't really done healing in this world. What we've done is made it so that the people with the most privilege still get to have the best therapist. And that doesn't work. Right. As you're talking about this, what I'm going back to the beginning, like how did we get here? And I'm thinking about the ancient Greeks essentially were the first like individualist culture, right? And and <laughs> what was like their biggest legacy? The fucking Olympics, which is about competition, yeah. right? And so like, individualism is bred by needing to be better than someone else and needing to have more than someone else. Right. And so that led to capitalism, which is then of course, like I am going to hoard the resources. I am going to be the master of these resources. And I'm using that word very deliberately. Right. Mm -hmm. It's all about power and control. It's not about healing. It's not about community. It's about product over people and profit over people and power over people who then feel like they are low and and their self-esteem crumbles. And now I have to go pay someone a zillion dollars an hour to give me a private session so I can have any self-esteem. And I'm calling that foolishness out. We cannot sustain in a mental health industry. I shared the article that I wrote with you, like your therapist is hurting. It's because like we are all siloed off into our little rooms, right? And unless you're in a group practice, but still it's all that individual stuff. And like the medical industrial complex is failing. COVID has shown us just how much we're barely holding our shit together. Barely. (laughs) Barely. Barely. And let's talk about what happened to therapists when COVID happened and therapists weren't getting paid. But they were working Mm -hmm. all these extra hours to help with a global mental health Mm -hmm. crisis, a huge Mm -hmm. trauma, while not even getting the insurance payments that they were promised. It was crumbling people's practices. Therapists were not able to pay their bills or feed their children. And we didn't talk about that. We just moved on. And so I think that there's power in telling the truth. And also in my work, I think that there's power telling the truth, not sugarcoating it, but also like, Let's still use that playing, that individual and group playing for joy. And so I am still taking naps. I'm still eating my snacks. I'm still moving in the direction of my joy, not just as some inspiration for other people, but for me. Can I make an observation on that for you? Because that's what I feel like has changed in you. I feel like when we had this conversation the last time, and I didn't know this at the time, it's all in hindsight, but the eating snacks and taking naps was a form of revolution and rebellion, right? There was a very, I am going to do this because fuck y'all, this is how I'm going to show up in the world. (laughs) But now like you have come into your soul and your body in a way that is so expansive and it just is. Now the rest and the play just is instead of it being something that you're creating. That shift is what I recognize in you that is so infectious and so authentic. It like could not be more authentic. I receive that. I appreciate (laughs) that. I think that what I realized is that like, if you go on to IndieWithLove.com and you look at the website, there are all these experiences 
that I created and did for mental wellness and they are now digital and, you know, there's still support groups happening and all that stuff. I'm co-creating with folks, but what wasn't present is I work so hard and so fiercely and so protectively of my people and of my family and of my community that I never got to be a receiver because I was always a giver. I was always a giver. And my friendships and my romantic relationships and with my lovers and with my family, it was how can Mashera give? How can Mashera help? How can Mashera inspire? How can you go to Mashera and she can change your life? And in the meantime, as I was determined that people who are like me have worth and value and deserve sanctuary, I didn't have any sanctuary because everything that I wanted to experience, I had to create it myself. About the labor of Black women. Right. Then I had to facilitate it. Then I had to be the door person. Then I had to market it. Then I had to close it out. Then I had to give the tell people how it went. How did I ever get to enjoy it? And so I had to learn to insist upon space in my life where friends take care of me in the ways that I deserve. As I tell them they deserve good things, so do I. I had to make sure that I was in relationships, romantic, friendship, platonic, and family relationships where I am the receiver. And I had to create a life in which I get to experience sanctuary that I didn't have to build first. Because I think marginalized people keep saying we don't have things and that everything is centered around whiteness and straightness and being able-bodied. And what do people do? They suggest we work harder by saying, why don't you make it? Why don't you create it? And it's like, Mm -hmm. because you didn't have to go create that thing, you're putting Mm -hmm. more unpaid labor on the people who need rest the most, need rejuvenation, need pleasure and enjoyment. And so I've had to shift parts of my life to make sure I am in sanctuary space within myself, within my relationships, within all collaborations I do, and within my literal environment day to day so that I get to be in sanctuary and not just help others make it or host it for other people. Right, right. And the opportunities that unfold based on you really in a very deep, nuanced and subtle way, because this is, it's really subtle, actually, because we talk about boundaries, right? And there's a difference between, I'm going to set this boundary so that you don't do the thing to me that I don't want done. Yeah, I don't believe in those types of boundaries. Right. But the boundary that you're talking about is let me just tune in to me first, see what it is that I need, and then I'll let you know what I'm available for. Exactly, because boundaries are not supposed to be about other people. And when we use phrases that make them about other people, we're not viewing them as a kept promise to self. I deserve to look at my life and see what do I want? What do I need? What do I desire? What brings me pleasure? Now, let me make a promise to myself about my pleasure. And that's what a boundary is. And so I'm coming more into alignment with my pleasure and that changes how I move as a healer in the world. And Mm -hmm. I think that's good for me. I also think that's good for community. It sets a precedent and gives a model and example, but it really is about why do we have so many dry healers? I want to be a juicy healer. I don't want to be exhausted. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be drained and strained and Mm -hmm. become for the greater good because I care so much about community. Like community matters. I'm a member of community too, though. I'm a person too. I'm Mm -hmm. community too. Where is the community that I reside in and thrive in? Not just that I give to and strain myself for. And so no one who I can blame put me in these situations, I had to realize that that was the mindset that I was embodying as a healer, that a healer has to give, 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 give. Mm -hmm. And now I'm like, no, no, no. If you come to a two indie with love experience, whether it's individual coaching, it's an institutional training, because folks ask, you know, will you train us to do this or that? I'm like, we're going to co-create. In communal mental wellness, that's what our ancestors were doing. They were co-creating. 
they were playing together. They were gathering together. They were feeling together. They were healing together. So I don't have to pretend I have all my life together. And then you get to be the person who is broken. And then I act like I'm some expert over you. No, we're going to co-create this together. I do have training and expertise and I am tapped into my ancestral lineage and the healers that came before me within my bloodline. And so are you. So are you. And so I'm going to help you give yourself permission to thrive while I give myself permission to do the same. And that's what's changed. And who would have thought it's more affordable for people to access healing that way? Like to be a part of my mental wellness space, it's $17 a month. You want individual coaching with me? Oh, it's more than $17 and it's worth it. But I needed to find ways to make the healing juicy for everybody, not just the most privileged. And that meant me too. I deserve the juiciness too. You sure do. Here we are. Well, you know how much I love you so much. And I always look forward to any time that we get to talk. And I I really, really hope that listeners can drop into the energy of what you're saying and just how important it is. Yes, yes, yes. We did it. Yeah. Thank you for being you. Thank you. I love Mashera so much, you guys. Do you love her now too, if you didn't already love her as much as I do? I hope so. If you'd like to find out more information about her, you can visit our website at www.headhearttherapy.com slash podcast. Thanks as always to Andrea Clunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for editing, to Liam O'Donnell for the album art, and to Ben Mueller for our theme music. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.